Hello everybody and happy St. Valentine's Day and on this St. Valentine's Day we're bringing you a story about the murder of an RAF pilot by the by the Germans. That's a romantic theme, uh, perhaps not, but hey, the restaurants are closed anyway, so what can we do? So um, before I introduce my guest, uh, Steve Darlow, who has been on before, I just want to give a little introduction to what we're doing today. And over the course of World War II TV, those who have, have stuck with me, we've talked quite a lot about air crews and losses of aircraft and and often in terms of statistics and what we're going to do tonight is we're simply going to look at one single story from from world war ii and you know when the, with the tens and thousands of, of allied and indeed german air air crew that were lost in world war ii sometimes the figures get so overwhelming it takes to go down to one story to kind of come to understand what happens to to these these crews when when things don't go right on a mission so that's what we're going to talk about so joining me live again from england is steve darlow prolific author of numerous books good evening steve good evening paul good to be back so i'll let you start the story but we're talking about a, a tempest pilot an australian who was serving uh, you know with with the british in 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 the uk and what happened to him in september 1944 so before we get into the story when you're as a as an author of numerous stories sort of big picture stuff small picture stuff individual air crews how did you first come up become aware of this story and want to write about it well that's interesting and uh, interesting what you said in your introduction as well because um I first came across this story in another book called Victory Fighters, which re was following air support really uh, to Normandy and, and after that, and I came across this particular incident. And I'd written a number of books, and I'd written from the RAF perspective, aircrew perspective, and I, and I wanted to get into another angle of, uh, of the air war and how it became very brutal, obviously. Um, and as you said, you could look at the general picture but i felt narrowing it down to one particular incident allowed me to look into the backgrounds of all the individuals involved and that is the pilot himself his squadron um, the perpetrators of the the particular crime the investigators uh, the actual trial itself look into the judges so you can really get behind and get some detail and, and what were their motivations and what was their thinking as they're going through the investigation and the trial and i came across um this particular incident, and it had a lot, um, a lot to it. You know, it's, it's not a Nuremberg trial or anything like that, but it's got some really interesting aspects to it uh, about the air war and the position that it was at. Um, this incident took place on the sixteenth of September, forty-four, the day before um, before Market Garden. Mm. So I, I managed to find um, had this incident, and then the, the research process was was quite extraordinary. I managed to make get in contact with the family of the pilot uh, in Australia. Um, and that's quite quite difficult, really, because actually all they knew, all they'd heard, was that Bill um, had just been shot, uh, and they didn't know anything about this story. And you've got to be very careful in that respect, because his sister was still alive, this 90-year-old lady, and she's got fond memories of her, her brother, and you're bringing a dark story to light, and you're bringing certain things that you, she may not particularly want to hear. So you have to be very, very... Uh, careful with regard to that. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I started uh, researching Bill's uh, particular uh, story. And I, 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 do, you, do you want to start looking at some of the slides? We can. Yeah, um, sure. And, and I just want to say, progress. again, for those watching, we've talked a lot with people like Damien Lewis and, and Helen Fry about the various changes, is that we have an idea from the early part of the war, kind of the halcyon days of the Battle of Britain, of a bit of sort of chivalry uh, with regards to pilots and, and the, the, the knights of the sky and the Luftwaffe pilots saluting at RAF pilots, things like that. And, you know, by the time you get to 1944, Hitler has issued the notorious commando order, which shouldn't really apply to air crew, but there's occasions when it clearly did. And things, although we're now winning the war, in many ways, the dangers to air crews, especially when you're bailing out of occupied Europe, are getting worse. Um, and this seems to fall into that category. And again, perhaps there's a bit of pressure. The Germans are feeling they're, they're being pushed into it and, and more pressure from above and, and, and we'll bring into that, that side of things later on. But I think I wanted to get across the point that there's, a, there's an evolution of change during the war where what happened to you in 1940. Uh, for you, Tommy, the war is over. Off you go to a prisoner war camp. 1944 a little bit different but yeah let's bring the, the slides up and we'll we'll um we'll talk about that so the first one is is of a of, a, of an air crew so I'll, I'll hand over to you to explain who we're talking about yeah so that's that's an 80 squadron there um uh, and bill is 
crouched right at the front there, uh, second second from the left um, with the moustache. So that's that's Bill exactly there. So when he joined eighty Squadron, they were on uh, Spitfires. Um, uh, he was operational in, in the D Day period, and then during the time that he was he was there, they converted uh, over to Tempests. And at the time of our incident, they're um, they're carrying out armed reconnaissances uh, pretty much o- o- over Holland. Because at this point, 16th of September, you've got the advance market gardens about to start, um, and the V2s have started coming over as well. So you've got the train lines. Yeah, there's a uh, the, there's the Tempest. Um, Bill flew some V1 patrols in the Tempest as well, and some uh, NTV1. Um, so then you get so on the 16th of September they're they're carrying out an armed reconnaissance and just going back Paul to the point you were talking about the the sort of deterioration in the way people were, were treated and I, I detail this in the book in one of the chapters I call it uh, the rise of the terror flieger uh, the terror flyer so and the, and the propaganda that comes about following the Cologne raid of 1942 and then the bomber offensive at the back of the Ruhr and and Hamburg. Um, and you start seeing very much Goebbels putting out uh, propaganda, uh, the Gau lighters reinforcing it um, to the fact that any air crew that come down uh, in enemy territory, if the public are taking out their revenge upon those particular airmen, then uh, the, the, the authorities were not to interfere. Uh, were just to allow it to happen. So it, it, it got to that particular point against the Geneva Convention. Um, acts of violence, public curiosity, they're all um, legislated against in the Geneva Convention. And any individual uh, prisoner um, has a right to, to defend themselves if they're, they're accused of something. And that's something I do want to touch on in the book. You know, this is a young man who's come down in occupied territory. Uh, he comes, he's found... And the judge, ger- judge, jury, and executioner are, are there at that moment. You know, he's not captured and taken away and put on trial. And it's all about he is merely seen as a terror flieger, a terror flieger. Mm. There's no which is testament to how successful Goebbels' campaign was, isn't it? In the, and, yeah. and you touch on that in the book. You talk about the psychology behind these people because it's. I'll let you tell the story, but it's kind of lower level. That these aren't these aren't you know colonels and generals and mayor it's kind of a lower level underlings of people who are taking it upon themselves to do these things that probably and you touch on this in the wouldn't have done these kind of things they're caught up in a regime they're believing this propaganda they're in a uh, they're in a in a world that they 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 have no control over and it it's 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 in- incredibly revealing about the breakdown of this sort of natural society and order that Goebbels is able to, and Hitler is able to uh, capitalize on and take these people who are essentially ordinary human beings. Because I think we can kind of look at those people, the real awful, the, the Mengele's and the, and the Hydrics, and we can kind of say, yeah, they're just evil shitheads. But these underlings, they're probably not that way naturally they probably are just more like you and i and they get caught up in this and i found that i like reading books about aviation but i'm not a i'm not a an aircraft i'm not a oh there's a mark nine with a so and so i'm not that kind of person what interests me is the people it's about the crews and the people and how these people get caught up in this and that's what this story elaborates on so so you've set the scene so september market gardens about to happy with happen we're trying to the Allies have had a good a good run. We've been pushing through Belgium. Things are looking like you know the the, the, uh, the war may be over by Christmas. That old chestnut, and then you know things take a turn for the worse. So let's talk a bit about the pilot and who he was. You say he's an Australian. So how did he come to be in the Air Force in the first place? Well, he was just uh, um, as I as I touch on in the book that he was someone in Australia, and he was keen. To- to come and fight for what was perceived as a mother country. You know, there's not that Australia-England rivalry now that you might have on the cricket pitch. Yes, there's, there's Bill on the left there. So, you know, he was keen to come and defend the country, to defend, sorry, to defend the motherland, to do the, the Battle of Britain. Um, so he was prepared to travel across here to do that and do the training um, and, and become a pilot. And as I say, he was involved in these armed these arm reconnaissances there. He had engine trouble, uh, shot up. And he had to crash land in the in this field, which was just on the the Dutch German border. 
which is quite an interesting uh, angle, really, because not everybody there is a Nazi. Not everybody is sympathetic uh, to the Nazi cause. So the actual incident took place. This is a map from the um, investigation papers here. So you've got a place called Elton, uh, which is just a sort of uh, centre center south uh, east center yes yeah, center south east just there Elton. um the incident happened just just to the north north of that in in a field he crash landed in a field and in fact the war crimes trial actually took place in elton they were very keen when they were putting on these trials to have them happen in the incident itself so um yeah this is a map that you can pick up and they've got a um is it an RF round up there where the actual incident yeah, took yeah. place? That's on the, the um, Air Crew Reports website. And it may a great, great resource for those watching this. It's lots of information there about all the a lot of crashes throughout throughout Europe. So researching this book, I went to that and stood stood there. I mean the research process was something quite extraordinary, actually. Um I went and stood there, and then one of the main witnesses who actually uh, saw the incident, uh, he lived to the south of that, and I went to meet the family and went in their house and we talked about and the incident um, itself. So, yes, yeah, so Bill came down. Um, I mean, I don't know how much of the book you want me to give away, but... Uh, well, yeah, it's not giving everything away, because, um, um, yeah, which kicks, but obviously we've got to go through the main points of the, of the story, yeah. but, you know. So he was very, very... He survived, clearly, and they, inve they investigation papers afterwards showed that there was no blood or anything in the cockpit, so clearly he was fine. Uh, he, got, he managed to get out of the aircraft, and then local customs officials... Uh, uh, two police officers um, and believed to be some soldiers, that's where it starts to get a bit ambiguous, went to the field searching for him, found him. Um, very, very, he was beaten up quite badly and, and was shot. Um, and then there were efforts were made uh, to take his take his body away and he ended up in, in Dusseldorf Cemetery, although now he's, Bill is, is now buried at the Reichsfeld, um, Reichsfeld Cemetery. So um, you've got these perpetrators, and there, there's that, that's right, that's Bill's uh, Bill's grave. So originally he was in Düsseldorf, but then he was moved to the Reichsfeld. So you've got the perpetrators who have carried out this crime, and then just after this incident itself, Emmerich was absolutely. I don't know, Mullard. <laughs> Mullard. Yeah, okay. Mullard's too easy a word. But uh, Emmerich was heavily hit by an RAF bombing raid, as was Cleve. So as the Allies are pushing up towards the Rhine, Cleve and Emmerich were, were hit. And I was particularly keen to tell the story of Emmerich as well, because that is sort of like the bombing context within which this incident happens. And Emmerich, there's a mass grave in Emmerich where the civilians who were killed, I think we've got a, 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 an image of Emmerich. Uh, Paul. Um, Emmerich is very close to uh, Elton where this incident happened. Um, so you've got Emmerich once, so that's Emmerich pretty much flattened after this raid. Now, through Emmerich, you've got a train line coming. No doubt V2s were travelling through there. Was it a legitimate target? It's the other side of the Rhine. You know, we're coming up to Operation Varsity. Um, then you've got Cleve, the other side, was hit very, very heavily. And you've got that, you've got a mass grave of these civilians in Emmerich, and just on the other side of the Rhine, you've got the Reichsfeld Cemetery, where all the, um, you know, half of it is is, is pretty much uh, RAF. So I was able to tell the story of a lot of the people in in Emmerich and their experience of that particular raid and their experience of the other bombing raids. And it's to create that context of what would you do if your town has just been bombed or if an aircraft comes down and strafes down your road and, almost hits your children, and then the pilot bails out and puts his hands up. You know, what would you do? How would you react to that? Or if the pilot has killed someone you love, and immediately they put their hands up, does that m not make them responsible anymore? But how do, you, how do you know it's that particular pilot? Should they be taken away and put on trial or, or whatever or something like that? So it throws up that, that sort of dilemma. Anyway, the Emmerich is, is overrun, and the perpetrators sort of disperse as uh, as the war goes on. One of them ends up in, in Stettin, uh, which is overrun by the Russians, and his family, his wife, is um, subjected to atrocities whilst he's up in Stettin. Um, and then after the war, they start returning back. But the local people are not happy. Some of the local people are not happy about this incident that took place with this airman. And they start reporting it to war crimes 
investigators. The Allies have set up their war, the, war, the, the CROCAS, Central Register of War Crimes and Security Suspects, this enormous volume of suspects that they put together. Um, the Allies have got this, put this together and there's a prima facie um, case uh, that needs investigation. And um, incredible, really. I, looking through the investigation papers, I came across this chap called Waddy Lehman. I think we've got a picture of Waddy, haven't, haven't we, Paul? Um, um, Canadian yeah. investigator. Yeah. Hang on. That's all right. So uh, initially, it was believed that the that, yeah. That, so there's Waddy there on the left. Initially, it was believed that the pilot was Canadian. So there was a Canadian unit put on them, and Waddy on the left there. Uh, I, I, I knew a little bit. I knew he was Canadian, where he came from, and I managed, and I managed to find him through Google, and he was a, a high profile in some organisation in Vancouver. And I managed to get in touch with him, and he sent me all his papers. Um, quite extraordinary when you you get to speak to these these gentlemen. And what he said, his training to become part of this investigation unit was that he read every Ellery Queen novel that he could, hmm. and that's how he learned how to be an investigator. But he said he he still recounted, he still remembered exactly that he was taken to that particular field where the incident was was taking place by some of the witnesses, and um, there in the grass was a denture, and they pulled out retrieved this denture and that denture is used as part of the identification of the pilot because that's the initial process originally bill was recorded as undercant he was as unknown when he was originally buried um so they had to uh, identify exactly who that was and then the body was exhumed there was a, a, a post post-mortem was, I, was I, just, carried, I, just wanna, I want to recap for the for the for those watching so yeah. um he crashes. He, he crashes. He, he, he survives a crash, and initially, he's just buried as an unknown, without any idea that there's anything untoward happened. He's just another victim of war. He could, you know, as as Allied pilots are being buried uh, throughout throughout the world at this point. So, because your book kind of explains the story, kind of you found it. But it was found out backwards. It wasn't that the, it was the locals coming back and saying something a bit untoward happened there, and then they went backwards to look at this because. And I get it in Normandy all the time. People say, you know, when we when we I take people to where a particular aircraft came down, they say, was this crash never investigated as to why it came down? I go, I said, well, no, not really. I said, do you realise how many aircraft are coming down kind of weekly in, in Normandy? Mm. There isn't the time to, to investigate them all. So a pilot dying and being buried, well, this is happening sadly, week in, week out. So why why would there be any reason to go backwards and? And investigate so it's the it's the story of the locals that is that is the story that kept me with the book because it's it's that i had to discuss with, with mag my other half about about france and this idea you, you touch on it of when is collaborating collaborating when is following the rules when are you when are you part of the mechanism when are you against the mechanism what do you do someone's as you say someone bombed the city or the town near where you live you've seen people suffer you've seen people made homeless been killed there's a person there it raises all those questions of of, of is it again as you said what would i do what how, how where does guilt become involved when when does being part of something abhorrent uh when do, when do you when do you stand up so 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 going back to where you are in the story there so these questions are raised and an investigation started and they go and find the dentures so um I'll, I'll hand back to you to explain the next part yeah. So yeah, uh, one of the the farmers whose field it actually took place. So he's on the Dutch. This is the Dutch German border. He's not sympathetic to the Nazis at all. So he's able to give a statement to the investigators that that actually happened because he he witnessed the situation. And um, part of the research for the book, I was in his house, and the family were telling me that they were no fans of Hitler. And the way they described it, the only picture of Hitler we had in our house was on a postage stamp. Um, so there's no there's there's no sympathy in the area. And then. The war crimes investigators, they start building up a picture because there's more uh, witnesses that actually um, talk about the incident. And then they arrest the perpetrators and they give statements about what actually happened. And it's quite interesting uh, in reading the statements that they don't really think that they've particularly done anything wrong. That's the impression you get. They were following orders. You're into the following orders uh, scenario here. Um and from that, 
the, the war crimes investigation unit, they when they find out then it's an Australian and the British take over the investigation and they build a case up and they decide to put four of these the perpetrators on trial and they put them on trial in Elton in a in a, um, a hotel, a small hotel, um, very, very near to the actual incident uh, itself. And um, a defence lawyer is appointed uh, who is uh, British, I think he was, I think he was a, a Canadian actually, uh, he, he is appointed for some of the perpetrators and the German is appointed for one of the other perpetrators. And they, but also I wanted to do who the judges were, who, who the yeah. men. Who this, were remind us what date was this? this This trial was what date are we talking about? So this was, um, let me, let me think. So the, the, what he was in the field in July 45. I think it was, it was, yes, it was in July that they actually found this, he, he found that. So that's not, you know, it's not too far after, it's a couple of months after the war that they're starting to do this. I can't remember off the top of my head the actual date of the trial, but yeah. it was, I think it was, I think it was early 46 that the actual trial um, took place. And the men who are carrying out the trial, the men who have got to judge what these men went, went through, um, they've been through, one, one was a member of an artillery unit, uh, one was another, a battalion commander, and they've come through Normandy and they've come up through France and Belgium. They've seen uh, the war, and um, and one of them was an Australian airman as well. And they're in judgment of the, these four men, and, and you start questioning um, what's their impartiality with regard to actually carrying out this trial. Now, is it fair for me to question their impartiality? But nevertheless, you're researching this thing, so... Were they ever going to find these guys innocent? Was there any possibility whatsoever that they were going to find these these chaps innocent? Um, so I don't, I don't know if we're going to go on to whether they find them innocent or not. Well, well, it's, that's <laughs> I entirely might, up to you. I, mean, I might have just given it what, away anyway. What, again, is so fascinating is that this come up on other discussions is that by 1945, 1946, everybody is just war-weary. Everybody wants to just get on with life again. And so you see it in other war crimes trials, where there were these officers, be they Australian, British, American, Air Force, Navy, they may have been away from home for five or six years. And now they've been put on this duty. And it's like, I want to go home. I want to go and see my kids. How long is this trial going to take? Well, it could take a week. It could take six weeks. Let's try and wrap it up in a week. Now, does that is that wrong? I said to Mag when we're having dinner, I said, Maybe they should just look, put everybody inside for five years and say, we're going to start all the trials in 1950. Let everybody kind of get over the, the war we're in and then come back and look at them objectively. But it, you can't lock people up without – that's a basic fundamental principle of our system is innocent into proven guilty. That's that's how our, our mechanisms work. So I can – it's a fascinating period, this 1945-1946. You see it. I'm having Guy Walters on next week talking about the hunt for the great escape, the stag of three escape for survivors and people just aboard. The Russians are what they want to go home. The Germans, everyone said, just like rebuild. There's, there's towns to be rebuilt. There's lives to get back on with. And now we're going back and raking up this past that everyone is fed up with. So yeah, I, I think you can question in people's impartiality. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just, it, it's not that they don't care about justice. It's just that it's a really bad time for everybody. Is that I fair? Think, absolutely. And and you touch on a point with regard that initially they thought the pilot was Canadian. A lot of the initial investigations were carried out by Canadians. Well, by the time of the trial, they've gone home. They have they've <laughs> had enough. So their depositions cannot be cross-examined. They just have to be accepted as the statements. Uh, for these for these investigators, so I think yes, I think you can can question the impartiality, but th this is an important distinction, um, and it that op it opens up another side of thing. Yeah, when Bill landed in that field, he was not given due process. He was it was decided in that instant that he was guilty of being a terror flyer, and therefore he he had to die. The perpetrators of the people who did that are being given due process. There's a record kept. They give it. They're giving a, a defence. They can state their case. So there's an important distinction between um, between those those two incidents. Um, but one I, I, one thing I, I I try and touch on and try and cover is I 
I don't like group identity narratives. I find that I find them difficult. I find them very, very dangerous. And I think this is a from the Second World War. This is an example of seeing a pilot as just a terror flyer. Therefore, he's guilty. And also, the perpetrators they're in the Nazis party. They must be guilty. That's it. The, 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 well, if you had an official position in Germany in the 1940s, you had to remember the Nazi party. Yeah, you didn't have any choice. Does that make you automatically guilty? But just going back to the, the crime itself, um, an important aspect was it. I'll go into a bit of detail. Of it. Poor old what, what is interesting, why don't we talk about what they were accused of and yeah. what the, uh, but we don't have to go with the verdict. We can leave the verdict uh, um, without announcing I, I, what the, what, 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 the, what the accusation was. I, I mean, I don't, I don't mind going with the verdict. I think, because I think, Paul, this is, it's not so much a who done it, this book. It's a why done it. It's an a why done it. Yeah, very good point. Why, why people did it. So I don't mind going into the, um, the verdict. So four, four men were accused of, of the, the murder of Bill. So Bill was arrested. He was beaten up very badly initially. And um, there was a, one, one of the gentlemen was a forester. He was a police. He was a police officer. There was another police officer, and there were these two customs officials as well. So those four were put on trial, and Bill was beaten, and he was beaten up so badly, um, and it was quite because because you've got the autopsy photographs as well. So it was very um, it's very difficult researching this book, but he was beaten up so badly that he was going to die from the beat. The uh, pathologist was quite clear that from the injuries he'd received in the beating up. He was on the verge of dying. He was going to die within seconds. Then they get then the forester, a chap called Hans Renoth, uh, he's got a rifle and he, he claimed that there was a, uh, an army officer there who ordered him to give the pilot the coup de grace. And he stepped up and, and shot him. And he, he actually fired two shots. Uh, the autopsy could not state for certain whether or not a bullet had entered Bill's uh, Bill's body. So you have this you have this scenario where these men have beaten Bill up and he's about to die. He's definitely the, the, the injuries he'd had were mortal. He had seconds to live, and then the forester steps up and shoots him, and and and, and ends his life. So the the trial is going is is taking place, and it's uh, and and brilliant by the gentleman called Captain Diamond, the, the prosecutor, brilliant way that he exposes their, um, the way some of the, particularly one defendant tries to manipulate everything. Uh, but it's also interesting that some of the other defenders, they just don't get what, they don't think what they did was wrong. Um, they, were, they were obeying orders. I mean, one of them claims that he had a written, he'd got a written order, which he, he wasn't able to present at, at the trial. He'd gone after the event and managed to get it. So they claim. So they they don't see what's wrong, but um, anyway, we get we get to the end of the trial, and all four of them are found found guilty of it. Two of the two customs officials are given prison sentences. The other police officer is given a prison sentence, and he was the one who, because of the witness statements, he was the one who was most heavily involved in this beating. His rifle butt was broken uh, in the actual beating in, in striking Bill a, a number of times. He got a prison sentence. Hans Renoff, the forester, got a death sentence. Now, he wasn't involved in the beating up. But, and as the, the prosecutor talks about, and as the judge talks about, the, the point was that even though it was only a matter of seconds, and it was literally seconds, um, he'd, ended, that he'd, he'd shortened his life by a matter of seconds. That therefore constituted murder. And because of that, he received the death sentence. And afterwards, when, they, when the appeal was put through, and there's some particularly moving appeal letters that are coming in from acquaintances of, of Hans Renoth and his wife as well. She talks about him being a man of good Christian, good Christian standing, and he was a forester, and he was always very compassionate to animals. Um, but they, but uh, none, of it, none of it sticks, and it's decided, well, he, he ended the life by a couple of seconds. If Hans Renoth had have waited seconds... And I took I took this whole case to a barrister in London, and we worked through it. And he talked it talked it through me and helped helped me analyse it. If he'd have waited, a bit, uh, poor Bill was going to die anyway. But the fact that he ended his life by seconds therefore made it constituted it as murder. Wow. And um, yeah, so and it, it it was very difficult not to feel um, 
some kind of sympathy for that that man. He, he's I think he's a very he's a very simple man, and he actually states that, and his wife states that as well in the in the letter. He's a very simple man, but yet, um, and I, I, he probably was ordered to do it. Does does that make him guilty? Well, in the eyes of the law at that time, it did. If he'd uh, if he'd have waited a few seconds, he he wouldn't have been involved. He probably wouldn't even might not have even got a prison sentence. Although being there does constitute uh, some semblance of guilt. Anyway, they're, they're found guilty, and Hans Renoff is taken to um, Hamlin Prison, and he is uh, the, the, none of the uh, clemency, none of the appeals work, none of them stick. And in fact, in, during the clemency, the the judge advocate general talks about the other policeman. In fact, he should have got the death penalty as well as uh, Hans Rienoff, but he didn't. So they go to Hamlin, um, as in the Pied Pipe of Hamlin, where the prison yeah. is, and uh, that's where Albert Pierpoint, at the point then, is the, the, the executioner, uh, is doing his, his stuff. <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's already ex involved in the, the execution of the Belson, um, and Grayson and people, people like that, and, uh, and Hans Rienoff, and you look through the papers in the in the archives and there's Hans Renault's name and uh, and he's executed and he and he's buried at Hamlin prison and I think if you I think we've got a photograph taken in the 80s actually of um the graveyard where where these um where these war criminals that's right so that's that's the graveyard at Hamlin um where the war criminals uh, were actually buried so that was it then um now, when I went there to research this book, and I think it was about 2006, I went out there to research this. Uh, if, if we've got another photograph, yeah. if you can show yeah, that's, that's, that's it now. Now, as you can see, you, you cannot distinguish, the historian showed me around, you cannot distinguish what that place is anymore. Everything has been removed from there to, to show what it is because it had become a focal point for hard right. Um, every year they'd, they'd go there and assemble mm. around in there. Um, so it was becoming a focal point for for, um, for martyrdom, and that's where you, you can't distinguish exactly where Hans Hans Renoff is is buried. But it, just going back to Paul point, you're talking to Paul about people being weary of the war. You know, there were so many possibilities of war crimes that could have been prosecuted. So yeah. it got to a point in the early fifties where, as you say, the political will was just not there any longer. And the three gentlemen who got prison sentences were, were released early. Um, so they, 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 there was some uh, clemency, if that's the right word, was, was given to them. But if I could just touch on research in the actual book. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah. Um, I went out to Emmerich, stayed at Emmerich, um, visited the site, visited, met some of the actual witnesses as they were then. But what was quite remarkable was that the families of the perpetrators, the so four perpetrators were put on trial, they were quite willing and quite welcoming to me in their, their actual homes. Now, I'm the grandson of a bomber command pilot, and they knew that. I was quite openly and honest with them, and they had this, you know, they saw what had happened to Emmerich. They were familiar with that, and yet they were prepared to invite me into their homes. Beautiful cutlery. We had these extraordinary cakes and things like that. <laughs> the historian coming in there, and I, I just, I think they just wanted to, to, to have their, their side of the story perhaps told. And hopefully I've done it in a balanced way in the book. You know, it's not, I haven't told it as those nasty Germans. It is an exploration of humanity's ability to become brutal very quickly, yeah. very quickly, and to stop. And as soon as you stop humanizing, as soon as Bill was no longer a human, but he was a terror figure, it was easy for them to kill him. If they'd have known that he was a good lad who uh, liked a bit of rugby, you know, was a bit of fun in the bar, Stuff like they, they, that might not have happened, but they don't know that. He's just, uh, he's just someone who's been um, bombing above them. Um, and in the research in Emmerich, because we're meeting some of the civilians there and telling their side, I'll never forget one particular time I was sitting in the flat of this chap in his seventies. He was telling, telling me the story of the, the October forty-four bombing of Emmerich, and um, afterwards he had to go back into the town and identify the charred remains of his two teenage cousins and he you know he told me all about about this and then there were other residents who told me similar sorts sorts of incidents so this was an important book for me because i was able to beforehand i told the RAF side of the story i could also tell the 
the German side of the story about the effect of the bombing offensive and what it did to the psychology of people. Well, I was just, just going to jump in and ask you that because you have written a lot of books. You have overseen the publication of numerous other books and articles. And I, I guess it seems to me this was sort of a pivotal one in your career because, as you just said, there, you'd seen it from one point of view, um, metaphorically and sort of from the air, um, talking about bombers, where there's that detachment and there's that it does with talking about the bombing war become about numbers and tonnage and and total numbers of aircraft and and this and then you bring it down to the to one person and then four perpetrators and how complicated it is to be on the side of right because that's it exposes how your book exposes how imperfect our justice system was because the nature of, of any justice system is is it, it is going to be imperfect because trying to do the right thing is very very complicated and and this the, yeah this the, the 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 human tragedy of the four perpetrators being at various levels guilty but death sentences for some and prisoner for others and it, it, how how and the fact the guy's rifle butt broke i mean if it was a Mauser, I, get, I mean, I've played around with Mauser K98s. To break a rifle butt, you've got to be doing something, you know. You're not going to break it, dropping it on the floor. You're going to be doing something really, really violent with that. Um, and, and yeah, how just how complicated that post-war system was and how and exposing the 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 difficulty of being being right and how right isn't black and white. That's that's Life isn't black and white, you know, and that, that pilot represented to those locals the 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 horror of bombing and bombing is shit yeah. bombing is awful um no one's ever saying that bombing is nice you know i've got a cousin who was killed as a as a, as a navigator and became a lancaster pilot and he was killed over germany you know and what would have happened to him if he had jumped out and survived and he just bombed a city how would the how would the locals feel i mean one of the comments we had earlier on from someone saying but we british didn't treat luftwaffe pilots like that in 1940 um and it's a very fair and valid point. Um, but, so, but yeah, but the, we we might have done. We, I don't know. Um, but the the war was very different in 1940. And also, if if air crew were captured by Luftwaffe, they were they were treated properly because the Luftwaffe yeah. they understood the nature of the the war that they were uh, involved in. It was whether the, if they were caught by the civilians or the army, then they were um, particularly in trouble. But it did make me question. When I was researching it, I'd res I'm very interested in human story and human journeys and the development of people and these and young men and what what affects them, and that's sort of my research prior, prior to that. But it did make it did make me question the, the prosecution of the Allied bomb offensive, and I did um, go, go into Emmerich standing over the grave of a, of a lady and a four year old child from Emmerich. You know, you got to look at that and you got to think. Hang on a minute. Um, but it comes down to intentionality, in my view. Um, the bomber offensive, the intention of the bomber offensive was to defeat Nazism. It was not a, it was not a prosecution of a war of conquest. Yeah. Within within a couple, a few years of the end of the war, some of those guys who were dropping bombs were taking supplies in during the Berlin airlift. It's not conquest. The intention, the intention of the Holocaust is quite clear. What the intention was with regard to that, the intention of the bomber offensive. Was to, was the defeat, defeat of Nazism, and I mean that's a whole separate thing. How the we can talk about how the the bomber offensive escalated and, and that sort of things, and you're in a total war, and you don't come, you don't want to come second in a total war. Um, so it, it did make me question it. It did, I think, it matured my writing in regards to examining the the bomber offensive and the and the air war. So it, it was an important important step, and the, and the and also, although it's very difficult to what's right and wrong, we did put in a, a due process. People were given due process. New, the Nuremberg trials was a new process, a due process. And that is now in place now. And, and uh, international law can, can use that and, and, has, and has developed that. Now, some people just wanted the identification of the major Nazi war considered criminals. The major Nazis just be taken out and shot. That was yeah. that was an intent. That was an intention. But no, we went through a process that that showed that um, due process is so so important um, that yeah. we must have it, and we, and, we, we must and, fight for it. And it, it, I'm guessing this was for you 
a hard lesson in the difficulty sometimes in being a historian because you are presented with conflicting information that is running through the bias that all of our brains have because we we're not neutral we can't we try to be objective but we are always going to be subjected to certain points you've also got the fact that as you said you were welcomed into the homes of the people who were perpetrating perpetrate these crimes you've got an australian family who don't know the entire truth about their their loved one and you want to bring a story to light because you think it's always important to bring a story and, and, and get the, to the bottom of the truth. But you've got, you're juggling all these these mm. issues. And um, I mean, what, what was the reaction when you sent out presumably copies of the book to the family in Australia? And the, what, 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 what did people say? Um, the, the family in Australia were very pleased. In fact, uh, it was it was a, a nephew actually came over to this country and they were very pleased that the story could be told because I was really, I really did not want to upset an old lady who had lovely memories of her, of her son. So they were fine. How it's received in Germany. I don't know, actually. Um, the gentleman who helped me out there, fantastic chap. Uh, he, he liked, he liked the book and he felt that it was very balanced and gave both sides of the story because it definitely does give the German side and the, uh, particularly the bombing of bombing of Emmerich. Um, that's in there. So uh, it, it seems seems to have been been well received. Um, um, and uh, what an extraordinary research process going out to Germany twice and standing in the field where this particular incident happened and and meeting the witnesses. Um, but as you said, but Paul, there's it, 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 it's it's so difficult and it's it's um, it, it's thick with contradictions. Um, you're going in there, and you, 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 you'll never find a right answer uh, with a book like this. Well, his, history is not a mathematical equation. There is not a right answer. There's interpretations, and our interpretations uh, change as, as from the context that we're living in now. We're, you know, we're applying um, living living in uh, in our freedoms and applying those freedoms to to that particular time. How, and how that goes back to how would I be, how would I have behaved in that in that particular in that field in that that particular incident. Um, yeah, I, I hope honorably. What does that mean, honorably? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it is. It is intensely fascinating, and and I don't know that I know the answer to it. And I would definitely agree that your book is it is balanced. It is objective. It you you try and you you try to be fair to everybody, and it, it was a really good read. A good in in the way that it, it also was quite disturbing at times of what what could happen. And as I said. At the top of the show, the fact that there are tens of thousands of stories like this, you know, and uh, Mag and I were on holiday in Spain, and and you find Commonwealth War graves and cemeteries on the coast of Spain. You realise people ended up there and Sicily, and and you think, how many historians would there have to be for every one of these stories to be investigated? And you know, you take things at face value, killed on the so and so date of the so and so, and you think, well, what happened? What was the circumstances of that? How did they end up to be there? And and we're we're only uh, you know I'm gonna use a weird expression we're pissing in the wind against this stuff we're never how many no matter how many stories we investigate there's a there's a million more to to look at so um, yeah I said as I said to come back you you do feel that the book changed it was a pivotal one in your writing process yes I I think so um, yes yes very very much um, I mean but, but my motivation. People often ask me, "Why don't you write about the Luftwaffe?" Well, I can't write about I can't write about everything. Um, no, I just I think it, it matured me as a writer. But I'm very interested in in human story and 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 young men. I've got two sons. Um, I'm a I'm a sports coach. I'm taught how young men mature and their development. That you start going into story. It's, it's very. It, I'm very interested in story and about things like that what they call the hero's journey and how theater portrays story and how film portrays story. Um, and it's to do with the psychology of young men. So it helped me in that, in that perspective, but it does res. And I also, I think this resonates and got me thinking resonates about certain things that are going on in society today. And particularly <laughs> we don't necessarily want to go into the politics of this, but particularly the, um, the rise of identity politics and group narratives which can be very, very dangerous. And I think this book is a lesson about how dangerous those group narratives uh, can actually be. As soon as you dehumanise someone and you view them as just a terror flieger, 
then that can open that open up atrocities very 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 quickly and the second world war is is full of that um that dehumanization so that atrocity can actually take place that that is to use the cliche that is a warning from history yeah um, no i agree and it's you know, uh, we've got a show coming up with about tomorrow about the uh, the SS in Poland in 1939, and I tweet about it. People say, "Yeah, but the Russians were just as bad." And well, well, it, but it's not the Russians are bad, or the it's individuals within regimes were bad, and others get caught up in it. And the 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 judging of individuals, uh, uh, judging of a race, or judging of a nation, or judging of an organization, is inherently wrong and 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 this single case that you know when you when you put the idea to me about doing a show on it and i got the book and i thought well a whole book on one case and you realize yes and i'm sure your book could have been twice as long because there were the numerous rabbit holes you could have gone down and do i present that point of view do i present that point of view and and it's just a, a can of worms of of potential um you know other stories to cover so yeah it's it, it i i i it is it's it is available the book i've put the link up it's the link is in the description below you can find it it's it's not it's because the second hand copies there's new copies it's available uh, around i would urge people to get it and have a look at it and it will it will make you question you aviation fans like patrick watching it will make you perhaps question things you thought you knew where you put people and organizations into categories and you go okay that's bad that's good and you go okay it gets a bit murky and um yeah and and i thank you very much steve for for presenting this to us about, and allowing us to to consider that life isn't quite as black and white as as it is since so just because uh the book is a few years old has anything turned up come to light since you published it has anybody sent you anything any more leads because you know the archives are being digitalized anything any new additions no there's nothing um in there uh, nothing that we found i mean they're, they're one of the perpetrators sus suspects there uh, was never found lovely to be able to find them but no nothing nothing has come up with regard to that although the subject matter does interest me and i know you've got in a in a talk coming up about a separate book sean feast yeah talking about uh, pina munda well sean with another author called mark hall they wrote a book called missing presumed murdered which was about a bomber crew that came down and was was lynched and they talk about the pro that the actual night that, that that night and the following day that that actually happened in the war crimes investigations trial. And I would actually, I would, if I've got the time, I would like to ex explore this further and and maybe even do another book on on a similar subject and maybe actually put it later on in the war um, with a bomber crew. So you you're around, you're looking at around about the Dresden time then, and there was a heavy raid on uh, uh, Fort Syme as well, um, and. If um, I'm a publisher, I'm, if anyone has the other side of the story about an incident that happened in this country, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure it must have happened. There must have been a Luftwaffe airman that came down um, that was not given due process. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm sure there's a story out there with regard to that. So it could well be in, in history is written by the victors and we didn't investigate our own our own things in quite the same way but um yeah no it, it is intensely fascinating and again thank you very much for, for sharing it with us and um in just to, to conclude because i think someone asked earlier on on youtube the cemetery that was closed down the one the guy who was buried there where is he buried now or, or is it is it and uh, is it been hidden so are we talking about the the chap who was executed yes yeah yeah, yeah. I, the, that, that, no, they, he's still there. They're still there, but they've they've taken away any sort of cross or anything like that in the grave. So you can't, you don't actually know um, that the 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 war criminals are buried there. Because also the, the the people who were executed because of the Belson trials, um, mm. they're, they're they're buried there as well. And it became a focus of far right activism. So the local authorities have just eradicated anything there. Yeah. So, but they are still there. Just there's no marker. That's what we're, that's what I was just trying yes, to say. Exactly. There's, yeah. there's 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 no marker, and uh, that's it. That's exactly. Yeah. That's that's, yeah. that's the that's the field there. So very eerie, standing there taking <laughs> taking those pictures. Because um, you know it doesn't look like anything, does it? But you know that in within there are, are buried some. Uh, well. Some very, very nasty, certainly some very evil people.
So well, they're in, similar, in Normandy, we have the Chateau Audier, which is sort of halfway between Bayer and Caen, and uh, a very nice four-star hotel, very, well, not this moment because of COVID, but, and there, you know, you walk up 100 yards away into the grounds, and there's where, you know, Canadian and British POWs are murdered by the 12th SS in, in June, and you're standing there, and you're, you're kind of looking away at a four-star hotel, then you're looking at this wood, and, you're lo- and there's nothing there to see now, and and yet it's it's very haunting to stand there and re, re, and it always is one of those things that reminds people that people like you and i and many of my guests we get caught up in the minutiae of the battles and how was that when we had prit butar and yes we we're talking about the destruction of army group center by four million russians and it becomes a, a, an exercise in math, mathematics because of the numbers mm. and yet all along that individuals are being killed and every individual has a family every individual has a backstory and would have had a future afterwards and it these stories are the ones that just remind you of the humanity it's, it's a humanitarian book it's that that and so many times as you said when i was reading it i was like, oh, you know what would i do what would i do in that situation and when, when does or when does carrying out orders when do you stand up against someone who gives you an order At what point do you stand and say no i'm doing it, not doing that and then you're endangering your own life in the mechanism. Mm. It, it gets very complicated, very, 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 um, very difficult to understand what you would do in those circumstances uh, because you wouldn't know until you're there. No, no, that's right. Yes, yeah. Well, um, this has been a fascinating discussion, Steve. And just for the purpose of people, what 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 are you working on right now? What's the next big thing coming out? <laughs> Well, I'm a publisher, so and we've been hit hard with the lockdown. Um, yeah, you know, we're not having any events, so you might be surprised to know, Paul, that I'm actually uh, in the middle of a musical. Okay, uh, about I'm, that did uh, surprise. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. No, <laughs> we've written, I've written a, a musical. I'm involved about the ATA pilots, the female ATA pilots. So we've actually just <laughs> we've cast. Um, we're workshopping it. We're doing it all online. We've got some fantastic West West End singers involved with it so it's called it's called if just it's called spitfire the musical because it, it's to do with the fact that the spitfire is a beautiful aesthetic thing to see but yet it's a killing machine oh and yeah you've got like that you've and you've got a contrast in there now part that, of that, that paradox contrast. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and also this book fly path to murder if i if i may i've actually turned this into a play um, and we're we're thinking uh, about uh, how we're, we're actually going to uh, present it as well, um, adapting it as a play. So, so yes, that, so that's a bit of a diversion, but it's fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I really um, was expecting to go down that way, but, <laughs> but it, it, actually, it, it is fascinating because it brings up we we will bring the show to an end that whole idea of the fact that if you were to do a music or when you do your music, I should say is it will bring this story to a different audience to the kind of people who read books. And that mm. in, it, in and of itself is a good thing because there are clearly people who would not walk into the military section of a, bi- of a bookshop, but would go and see musicals. So you end up in this overlap. It's when I've done the shows on comics, I've done the shows on swing music, whatever it would be. It's history is it's important to learn history, but not everybody wants to learn it the conventional way from being given a book. I mean, my own stepdaughters aren't really, in that sense, book readers. They are YouTube watchers. They are Instagram users. They are modern, modern two people. They go to podcasts is their thing. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to embrace the fact that what did more to highlight something of the Holocaust and Schindler's List, the movie. What did more to, to, to get across the evil of the Nazis and Raiders of the Lost Ark in a bizarre, twisted way? But it does, isn't it? That, and so musicals, comics, all these things, graphic novels, uh, board games, whatever it is, video games. We're doing, I'm doing some stuff in March about video games and board games and war gaming and how that is another entry into history. And so, yeah, musical, fantastic idea. It gets people talking about the war. It gets people understanding the past. So on that yeah. note, um, thank you very much, Steve, for joining me. Um, in, with, with hindsight, when I chose this, well, we, we set up this date for this discussion. February the 14th was an odd one. For it, but, you know, there we'll you finish, go. We'll finish with a musical. There we are, a romantic musical. musical, musical there we yeah. We're actually going to burst into song there and give, a, give us the first no. you know, the of, the, of, the, of the main characters uh, in a soliloquy in, in Act 3. But anyway... Yeah. Oh dear, no, no, no. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> so in terms of what we were coming up, folks, again, a little bit more um, 
uh, tragedy. So we've got, we've got Joachim Bola coming on tomorrow talking about the, uh, the SS in Poland in 1939. And then, of course, it's the, it's the uh, Iwo Jima week with a, a series of shows taking off the Pacific Island. I'm really looking forward to getting into that area there because if you're anything like me, those of you who are watching this who are British and European, just understanding the geographical hell that is Iwo Jima is very difficult. It's so difficult to relate to. And I'm talking about a battle in a wheat field near Corn. Well, a wheat field in Corn is the same as a wheat field in, in, in Nebraska. Wheat field is a wheat field. When you're talking about a volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific, it's just alien. So I can't wait to get to grips with what happened out near Wajima. And I hope you'll join me for those shows as well. So again, thanks, Steve, for joining us. Thank you, everybody else for watching. I'll end the stream now, and we'll see you all on World War II TV. Don't forget to check out our Patreon. Don't forget to check out, check out Steve's publishing. And we'll see you all again very shortly. Thank you very much for watching.